Welcome to The Socialscape, the only podcast in the galaxy bringing you exclusive social media insights from personal brands and businesses to feed you that behind the scenes information that you can't find anywhere else. I'm your host, Alex Legos. Let's get into it. Today's guest is Brad Ellis. Brad is the owner of Boston-based digital marketing agency Breakthrough Marketing Group. In this episode, we discuss how he left his 9 to 5, whether or not the influencer bubble is bursting, if Instagram hiding likes and follower counts is good or bad, and if every client should feel like they are your only client. Enjoy the episode and stick around for updates and more at the end. This is The Socialscape. What's up, guys? Welcome to The Social Scape. I'm your host, Alex Lagos. I'm so excited to be sitting here uh, digitally talking to Brad Ellis today. Brad, good to have you on the podcast, man. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. We, uh, we're psyched you took the time to sit down with us today, man. I, I'd love to kind of get into your bio a little bit before we kind of get into the more nitty gritty social media stuff, um, just so people sure. can have some more context to where your perspective is coming from. So tell us a little bit about where you're from, uh, your background a little bit all the way, you know, and then we'll get into like your college days and those formative years, et cetera. Sure. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so moved to Massachusetts when I was five years old. So pretty much my whole life has been in Mass. Um, towards Cape Cod, like half hour from the Cape, small town, um, Mattapoisett. Um, college, went to Bryant University where we met. So um, went there, studied marketing, communications, Really, I've always been interested in kind of the parallels between the two and consumer behavior, that type of thing. Um, got out of school, worked for a couple of years doing outside sales at a small media company. And my role there, among other account executives, was kind of ushering in the digital age. They had kind of predominantly been print for a while. Um, so bringing in new kind of digital landscapes um, to small business owners. And, you know, it was beneficial for me in that there was, you get a lot of freedom in those type of roles. Um, So it was nice to kind of be able to dictate your schedule, kind of coordinate your days. That really taught me a lot about time management and also tailoring certain, you know, conversations with different business owners from different industries, um, depending on their needs or their goals. So that was, that was super beneficial experience. Um, but I had just kind of, I needed something new. I got, it got a little bit like redundant for me. I kind of am always looking for what's next. So from there I went, worked at Colette, Um, which was in Rhode Island and I had more of a internal like inside role. I'm still an account executive doing more of the, so just for people that don't know, it's a vacations company. So doing more of like the logistical sides and planning um, different avenues of, of vacations for people did that again for, you know, year and a half, two years, something along those lines. Uh, I was commuting from Boston to Rhode Island at the time, which Yikes. I wouldn't suggest to anyone. It was tough. How so long that is was that drive? Part. It depends on the day, but at a minimum, I mean, like no traffic, a little over an hour, yeah. <clears throat> but it would be an hour and a half to two hours most times, either coming there, go, uh, heading there, or coming back. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're in you're in the car at least for three hours a day. Wow. And just And it's... It was not not the best. Yeah. So that was, I mean, I love the people that I worked with there and they have a good like family culture at Colette. That's one of the things I definitely really um, kind of enjoyed about Colette. They have definitely a good culture. Um, but again, found myself like almost, you know, similar kind of cadence where it was like, okay, it's almost like once you get something down well and you're you really hone in on it, it's like okay, time to take it to the next What's level. Next? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so when you started, I'll jump in. When you started mm-hmm. to uh, obviously happy at Colette, it sounds like everything was good, but obviously started kind of wanting more. Um, how did you approach um, 
getting to that next step? What were the steps? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going to be listening to this that are going to be wondering, you know, I'm in a nine to five. How do I make something else happen for myself and and get to that kind of entrepreneurial, uh, self-employed lifestyle that everybody glorifies? Yep. Good question. Uh, So I definitely, I was happy at Colette in that I knew my role. I knew my position. I had established relationships with clients and coworkers and people from different departments where it was making the role like what it should be. Um, but I wasn't satisfied in that, like the room, at least from what I was looking for, um, the room for like upward mobility and creativity wasn't necessarily there. It's like at a certain point, um, for me, it's like, okay, you can be the next level of an account executive, like it's really Great. the same, almost the same position. Yeah. Just a title change, maybe like a bump in pay. It's like not really exactly what I was looking for, looking for kind of like real transitions. So I would suggest as far as to answer your question, sorry, I just want, wanted to give a little good, like background, um, how to kind of make that transition. Um, there's definitely not like a specific uh, path. I would say definitely dip your kind of toes into whatever you think you're going to, like you think that you should go off and do writing or you think you should go off and start a yoga studio. I would suggest like, you know, teach some yoga classes first, obviously see if you actually like it because the, the thought of it seems always way more appealing than actually grinding it out and doing it. So I wouldn't necessarily, and you have to be someone who's ready for somewhat like big risk. Um, It's not necessarily having a steady um, paycheck, especially at the beginning, you don't have that guarantee. Um, you can save up and you can, you know, have a handful of clients that are, you know, if you're lucky enough on a retainer, but at first it's like, you're chasing that income that used to just be steady every Thursday or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, there's ways to like combat that is like I said, I would, if you're in my position specifically, like I was freelancing for one client so that I just could tell this is, this is actually doable while like you were at you see, Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's like, and it wasn't like the same offering as this Colette or anything of like course. that. So yeah. it's like completely different, but the whole, um, the whole premise being like, actually go do it and get a check off of it so that you know that you can make money doing it. That's mm-hmm. just the reality. It's like, it sounds great, but until you can actually bring it to fruition, yeah. Um, at the same time, once you do decide to do it, uh, you got to go full steam. And so that's like kind of um, contrary to what I was saying. But when you're, you know, I, I would say when you're thinking about it, trying to set up this situation kind of do it on the side yeah and then if you really realize like this could happen i'm gonna go into it you have to be super obviously passionate about it um but then you have to be i would say like methodical in i mean take the time that you're working we would be working at your nine to five or whatever and really work on what you want to do and the results are it's it's insane. That's yeah. what I was always thinking when I was sitting there um, at all these jobs. I'm like, if I was putting these this time to actually concentrated effort and yeah. like deep deep work, not necessarily just sometimes uh, you know emails or these different yeah. things that weren't necessarily yeah. Um, yeah, you get it. Yeah. Um, well, and, and so how long were you – and I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want to get back to the social mm-hmm. media stuff because uh, hashtag social escape. Um, but yeah. how long were Coming you doing – How long were you doing both? Uh, so, so, so I was how, freelancing and that. Yeah, at the same like time. Three to, three to four months. Okay. Not and, too long. And then that was when you made the decision of like, oh, I can definitely do this. This can definitely supplement. 
So I have been wanting to kind of head off and do my own thing for probably a year of the year and a half or whatever. Yeah. Like almost, you know, like six months in, nine months in, I'm like, all right, we got yeah, There's the a better year. way. There's a <laughs> yeah. better way. Yeah. It just, it was so like repetitious and I saw a lot of, and, and, and like I said, it's different for everybody. So, so, I mean, there's definitely value in like the security of those type of jobs. Yep. Um, but it's just a matter of your personality. Like if you, I get fulfillment from different things than other people might. So I get fulfillment from like having or in a creative lane, yeah. like writing or music, whatever it is, like seeing it come to fruition is huge for me. Um, well, you're creative. Sorry. So that could... But so, I mean, that said, talk a little <laughs> bit about what you, what are you doing now? What's like, you know, what's your, hey, we're, yeah. we're Breakthrough Marketing Group. Here's what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're a boutique ad agency. Um, we do you know, full service, everything from social media, website design, brand identity, like logo development, that type of stuff. Um, we do paid advertising a little bit, mm -hmm. um, SEO, those type of services. They're not necessarily um, like our calling card, but we do offer them depending on the client. Yep. Um, photography and video work and also some on the PR side of things, which kind of relates back to writing is actually one of the more, um, you know, fun things that we get to do. Like I get to, you know, write press releases and stories to be featured in publications. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy doing that. So that's kind of a quick rundown. So what, uh, your clients right now or clients that you've worked with, what industries have <laughs> you been able to get into? Yeah, every, <laughs> every and anything it seems like there's really been no um for better or worse there's not really been a specific industry that uh we've stuck to mm -hmm. um everywhere from a dentist office to wellness center yoga studio um like clothing brands um i mean it it varies pretty tremendously real estate agents uh yeah, it's, a little it's bit a of everything. Wide Good range, which, yeah. Which has been, yeah, which is I think going back to my days at um, the media company. It's called South Coast Media. So mm -hmm. um, days at South Coast, uh, it was similar in that it was such a wide range of people that I was working with. So that taught me um, the ability to kind of. Um, talk to different people from different lanes and different perspectives. Yeah. I, I, that's something that I really appreciate. And what I do is I'm, it gives you the freedom to really get into any industry, yes. which I think in, in marketing, I think is pretty unique. That's big for me. It keeps every day different. Yeah. And you know, I don't know. Can you relate to that? Yeah, definitely. And you're in an awesome spot. Um, as far as just like the creatives and musicians specifically, but just all different walks of creative kind of industry. Unique to be there. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely agree. I, to work with people that you do align with on that creative level, as well as on the business. Because or fellow like entrepreneurs, like we've done some work together, and mm -hmm. it's just like strictly the business side. Um, so that said, you're working with people from all over the place, from you know different industries, different perspectives, different mindsets, and a lot of times that comes demands um and you and i had yeah. a we started to have a chat the other day on the phone because we have a lot of phone calls together on the phone and yeah. uh and we get into a lot of kind of more grandiose topics and we thought oh this is one we definitely have to take to podcast platform yeah. and the question yeah. that i asked you was do you think that every client should feel 
like your only client? Awesome, awesome question. And uh, yeah, I'm glad. Feel we get free to, to rant on this kind one. Kind of bring this. Oh yeah, this is it's definitely going to be a, a ranter. Do you feel um, like every client so, should feel like your only client? Right. So the answer on the phone that I initially gave, which I still stand uh, stand by, but I kind of had had some more time to think about it. But I think that every client output wise quality of work that you're putting in should feel like your only client in Mm -hmm. that when they receive whatever it is you're working on, like, you know, a blog post that you publish for them or a logo, they should feel like, wow. Um, you know, they took the time, they didn't rush this. It, it doesn't feel like you have a lot of other things that you were placing your time on. You were placing it on this and it's meaningful work. Yeah. So I think that in that sense, they should feel like your only client. Um, I sense a butt. Far, yeah. <laughs> it's a, big, a big butt. Yeah. Uh, um, I, as far as accessibility, and this is actually... Oh, man, uh, do it. your only client and that actually is for their benefit too definitely for your mm-hmm. benefit as an entrepreneur giving you peace of mind so you don't get completely burnt out um i would say the irony is that the accessibility is something that for me and you we're both super accessible almost like 24 mm-hmm. 7 um almost to a fault though in the business sense because I think, uh, as I started to say, the irony is that when you start, that's part of your unique selling point. Right. It's like, okay, uh, you could go work for, it's basically when you start, um, you know, cost is a big thing. And then, I mean, accessibility, if you're one person or a couple people, yes, um, you can go to someone and say, you know, when you call, you get the principal yeah. decision maker. It's so easy to lump it into intimacy. Whenever. Where it's like, hey, you get me, man. It's not like I'm passing you off to my sales team and you're going to work with some agent who's, you know, some college kid who's getting paid eight bucks an hour or something. Yeah. It's me. It's it's you. And so that's a huge selling point. And that's what people come to get used to. Um, So then when you start to scale up and you start to have more clients, because at the time you're like, I only have, you know, two, three clients and this potential new client wants to work with me. Yeah. We're going to get it done no matter what, like you call on Saturday or Sunday. Sure. Picking up, handling it then. Yep. That's just because that's the, which you need that. But then at some point there has to be an understanding that like in order for me to continue to provide valuable services, um, you know, it, 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 you have to set something up, up front where it's like okay we're gonna do a weekly call or you know two calls a week bi-weekly call at this time whatever yeah depending on the extent of like scope of work you're doing Mm -hmm. but i've had to like re-implement that can you see uh just said i still got still working i'm still okay yeah okay it says poor connection on mine but whatever um you need to i've kind of had to re-establish that with a few different people um, and they actually end up, I think so far it's been, they, they end up valuing your time and your kind of expertise in the field and the conversation that conversations that you have even more Yeah, um, because they realize like, okay, we have this hour. Oh yeah. You know, you get to certain things. Maybe you don't, if you have a specific, like we're going to talk from 10 to 11. We're going to talk from one to two on these days. You come prepared with your agenda. You have everything. Um, but when you open up full range of accessibility, all distraction constantly. Yeah. Um, so it's tough, but it's tough because you do set it up front. Yeah. And well, and it's also, I think tough. for me at least, and for I'm sure a lot of other people, 
is that social media is a 24-7 gig in the sense that if somebody yeah. drops a comment on your pick at, you know, 1130 at night, mm -hmm. one, I'm going to see it. Two, I got to do something about it if there's something that needs to be done about it. Um, yep. And so it's very easy to take that and then also apply that to, well, if this part of my job is 24-7, then also I should be 24-7 accessible for clients. Yep. Um, and and I've the reason that I asked you in the first place was because I was struggling with kind of implementing that client contractor boundary of like, hey, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, I, I can't take your call at 1030 at night, you know, or, right. I, or I can't take your call at seven in the morning. I don't start my day at that point. Sorry, I'm not an early bird. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, you know, it's really, it's something that I'm still working through and trying to implement boundaries on, but I think a lot of it is, mm -hmm. a lot of my issue is that because I, I think of it as a 24 seven thing anyways. So why shouldn't that aspect be as well? And I know that that's incorrect. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It's, that's a good point. It's like you in this like entrepreneurship, um, realm, you always feel like that anyways, where it's like yeah. at any given moment you need to hop in you can do it yeah it's a blessing um, and a curse right so there yeah that balance is like such a fine line and i think that i mean you make exceptions mm -hmm. as you do with anything so if you have you know this is a reality for them if they really need it not that you wouldn't do that for a smaller client but it's just you have to realize like the prioritization just as they do with their services, whatever they're yep. doing, like you would expect them to do the same thing to you. I mean, you you call people all the time or you might call clients where it's like you're not an employee. That's mm. a big that's a big like well put. Um, yeah, I like that's that. a big th thanks. I think that's a good like. You have to remember that you're not their employee. You, you, they don't have full time access to you. Mm -hmm. Even though you feel like that's part of what you're selling, at some point, as long as I mean you're delivering quality work, that's why they're paying you. Um, and of course, keep the line of communication open. Yeah, I'm not saying not like to you know ghost your clients or anything. No, it's not just, like it's not like we're saying when people call, you're not going to pick up the phone. It's right. <laughs> it's no, more no, no. it's more of if you call me eight times a day, or right. you call me at absurd hours, or if I'm busy doing something else, the phone's not going to get picked up. Right, and luckily, um, I've been fortunate that most clients like understand that, and they, I mean, they are operating business owners, yeah. so they have honestly a lot of other priorities that are much higher up than you know, what post is going to go out, what blog. I mean, it's important to them, but that's something that I've found just scheduling specific time slots for it is super beneficial. Mm. So I guess at the end of the day, the answer to should every client feel like your only client, I guess is in terms of quality of work, yes, absolutely. Yes. But in terms of accessibility, in terms of, uh, yeah, I guess really just that, in terms of accessibility or in terms of their ability to make demands of you, um, that's a better way to put it. The answer is I no. Think, yeah. yeah, make them. In. I think that's a better way to put it, because the reality is we definitely are people like to be accessible. I like to, I yeah. pick up the phone. Um, well, I hate it when people don't pick up the phone. So I understand what that's like when people don't. But I also understand that when people are busy, then people are busy. Right, and you would want that. The other thing is you would want that. For your work, like if you're working on a client's work, yeah, and another client calls, you would want to them, uh, you know, you would want them to say, "Okay, I'm actually in the middle of this. I'll call you back." Yep. You wouldn't want them to be scatterbrained and like, t if you react to everything that's coming in, you're never going to get any substantial amount of work done. Yeah. And I read a si sidetracked work. I read an article. Um, the other day after we had spoken about this, I think, and it was talking about how um, being more inaccessible actually kind of gives you almost, and I cringed at this term, but it makes sense. It gives you kind of a more VIP feel, meaning mm -hmm. when you and when it's perceived that way, people bring their shit. People come with exactly. whatever they need to talk about. Yeah. Um, yep. And you're, I think you're able to be 
more productive in those instances because both parties understand that, oh, I can't just call you whenever I want. I have to take advantage of when I have you. It's like if you meet, you know, you meet a celebrity, take advantage of that, you know, five minutes you have with them or whatever, and you give them everything you want, especially if it's something like a business pit. I think they get the point. Um, I want to jump, I want to jump into something else that's going on. Uh, there's an article floating around. I talked about it on my Instagram this week. Um, and it's about an influencer who has, I believe, 2.6 million followers. Um, mm-hmm. And she posted basically confessing to her audience that she was, dealing, she was yeah. dealing with a manufacturing company who I'm assuming gave her a deal uh, because of who she was. They said, as, you know, all you got to do is sell 36 pieces. Mm-hmm. I believe they were T-shirts. Uh, you just got to sell 36 shirts. And if you do that, then we'll continue our relationship uh, on the the deal, whatever the deal was that they agreed to. And if you can't, yep. then we can't send anything out um, because I'm sure that's what they need mm-hmm. to sell to that's be able to cover their manufacturing. Order. Yeah. Yep. So, so anyways, bottom line is she basically confessed and said, I couldn't do it. Uh, I couldn't sell 36 shirts. And so the people who bought shirts, which was less than 35 people, you're not going to get your shirts and you'll get mm-hmm. a full refund. And she was a little bitter. What do you have to say about that? You know, there's people that have like amassed followings for real reasons, for real, you know, they have a certain talent or they have um, whatever lane that they're in, they're executing on and they've built a following um, genuinely. I think that that's like the big thing is uh, I think our generation is good at being able to determine when things are authentic. Mm and genuine or whether we're just being sold to. Yeah. And it feels like there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of people that are doing a good job and taking advantage of a marketplace that like can be super, not only lucrative, but helpful. Like you can do a lot of good things with having a platform that big on Instagram or whatever, um, you know, channel it is. And people are doing that. Um, and then there's also just like anything, there's people that are trying to exploit it. And some people are successful at exploiting it. And let's, then others like this. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, yeah. let's talk, let's stay on that before we get into the, our generation being able to kind of discern between authentic and inauthentic. Cause I, I think I really want to dive into that. There are people yeah. such as, like you were saying, such as celebrities, athletes, uh, musician, artists, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. those are people who have genuine influence on the people that follow them because people look up to them or look to them for things for whatever reason. And so when Will Smith says, this is my son's water company, boxed water, go buy it. People buy it. Just water. And that'll work. Yeah. Is that what it is? Just water? Just water. Yeah. Yeah. They're not paying for placement here. So, uh, anyways, (laughs) so people will go and do that because people are influenced by Will Smith. If you mm-hmm. are this influence, Yeah, if you are influenced, I'm sorry, if you are following this person with 2.6 million followers, you and 2.6 million other people uh, may just be following that person because you like their content. Because right. that's where you found them. That person was not a person, really, to everybody else. Right. It was until the platform came out. So there are so many influencers who I think don't understand uh, the difference between those two individuals, somebody who actually has pull because there's somebody off the platform before the platform right? compared to somebody who used the platform to become somebody on the platform. And it's not to say mm-hmm. that you can't you can't become somebody on the platform and then parlay that into now I'm somebody off the platform. There's plenty of examples of people oh, who yeah, have done that. Um, yep. Logan Paul, no nobody mm-hmm. until he decided to get on Vine and get massive, massive amounts of views. And now he's somebody outside of every platform. Um, yeah. And sells a shitload of merch. Really? Best yeah, example, sure dude. Does, yeah. Sells a shitload of merch. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So anyways, that to say, I think dis- being able to discern between those two people yeah, exactly. is a massive yep. thing. Mm-hmm. So let's now go to your next point, which is our generation is very good at calling bullshit when it's yeah, necessary. Yeah, we are. I think we really are. Yeah. Um, and I don't know necessarily where that 
stems from other than i mean we actually i do it's probably because we've been fed so yeah. much content throughout our life um whereas in past generations it we, it wasn't necessarily constant like sensory overload of everything's branded yep. everything um so we're able to somewhat see like if you know if a product placement is like genuine or if it's just thrown in there be- and the person got a check for it or yep. Um, do you remember when you, you started hearing stuff. about that? Do you remember when you started, like you first heard of influencer marketing? Like, do you remember seeing somebody post up a product and be like, wait a second, that looks yeah. kind of fishy. I remember. Um, I, I remember like the time frame. Yeah. I don't necessarily remember one specific like ad. But, but you I remember mean, the, so the switch yeah. flipping and being like, like, wait oh, a okay. second. This is the same platform as like people used to smoke Marlboros in yeah. the movies. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, or like Coca-Cola, whatever it is, different brands have always like subtly done that. Um, and now it's just, there's so many different screens, so much different attention yeah. that it's so like overt, it's not as subtle anymore. So it's like, and we're so aware of it. Um, so it has to be, it's gotten easier as far as like, there's no, it's gotten easier to be out there, but harder to actually break through and really um, capture. And that's the why you need breakthrough marketing. Ah, hey, we'll end hey. it there, folks. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's okay, cheesy. is that actually through the, um, you know, like yeah, is that authentic? Bullshit? Yeah. Well, and I was going <laughs> to say too, like, even I, I think in addition to the fact that it's become such a popular thing to just throw products and everything. It's uh, like I, I jokingly said earlier, like, oh, Just Water's not paying for promotion here, so we're not going to shut mm-hmm. them out. But like, what yeah. if they were, though? Yeah. That would exactly. be a really clever way to weave it in right. without people. Was, you, know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? If and it comes up, they're yeah, not exactly. paying like for up. promotion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, um... It takes ways like that, though, to, to I think, right. do well, a good actually, job a at good product point. placement now. Yeah. And I think people, uh, I mean, podcasts actually, oh, they do definitely get placements a lot now. Huge, in huge. Just, just in conversation, like they'll naturally bring it up. Like you just said, um, oh yeah, I've been using this investment app, uh, <laughs> like acorns. <laughs> yeah. It's working really well. And they're like, okay, that was somewhat like irrelevant, but we're going to keep it going. Yeah. Um, but if you can do it in the flow and like Kate, of a normal conversation yep. it's just this yeah it's it's that same example on like a massive scale well that's like, why everybody you can do it in a tv show or whatever that's why everybody thought the starbucks thing for game of thrones was product placement because yeah. they made it look like an accident yeah and i think at, yeah. a, at a certain point i think that becomes played out too first of all starbucks came out and said that it was not product placement and it was an accident but yeah. uh, and is that true? I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I think it's true. That's. But who yeah, knows? You know, I don't know the legal ramifications behind that. Like, do they have to come out and disclose? I think they do. Mm-hmm. But I'm not a lawyer, so. You know, yeah, I don't, yeah, does I don't a tweet know. does a tweet pass as as <laughs> lying about that? I don't know. But anyways, yeah, I I think yeah. Uh, I think there's creative ways to do it, and bringing it back full circle to the influencer thing. It's so like, okay, so this watch, Scoggin sent me this watch. I owe them a post. I love this watch, authentically. I love this watch, and they didn't pay for placement on my podcast. I'm just bringing this up as as an example. Or am I? But even even my post will not be a post like, man, Scoggin sent me this watch, and I love this watch. It's the best watch I've ever had. It's fantastic. Go get yourself a Scoggin. Yep. Even if I feel that way, I'm not going to do it that way because... It's it not. Off, like, it's inauthentic. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm I'm just a billboard that can be bought, and that's where I think so. Mm-hmm. I think so many influencers miss the boat because they view it as I'm just a billboard, even though they might right. not realize that. That's how their actions. That's what their actions are showing. It needs yeah. to be done I, creatively, and that's why I think the biggest variable. And I'm on record as saying this for a long time now. Creative is the variable in a good influencer okay. or a bad one. Definitely. I think, um, I think shoe brands do it really well, um, where they grab people not even necessarily in, you know, that aren't necessarily even like sneaker heads or whatever it might be. Yeah. It's like, they'll grab people, um, you know, whoever like skateboarder or 
an artist um, and just let them excel in their in their own space that they happen to be rocking their gear but they're not forcing them it doesn't seem as forced yeah Um, it's really actually i think i think overall like sneaker brands do that pretty well yeah they're able to see other creatives like maneuvering in their own lanes and like it's more more genuine it's a more informal lane too so that they have that going for like the just this this i don't know the Sneaker market, the streetwear market, all of that, you know, the first piece of advice I'd give to anybody who's creating a startup streetwear brand is pick 10 influencers and send them shit. Yeah. And don't tell them what to do with it or how to post it or anything. Nothing. Don't even ask them to post it. Just send it to them. Okay. Yeah. Just, you know? Yeah. Like a, a handwritten note goes a really far yeah. away, really long way. Um, well, and so in, it, that just said. Just real. That said, it's, bring it back it to the original to... question of is it is it popping? Is it over? Have has are there so many influencers now that we just see it as bullshit? We see it as a commercial on TV uh, or a commercial on the radio, and we just go click next. I don't want to see it anymore. Uh, yeah, I think the over like saturation of it may be coming to the end, but I think also people always find there's always the next like craze. Yeah. So there's always going to be an, I, I mean, there's always going to be another platform or another way for people to do similar types of like maneuvers. But yeah, I think that it's definitely getting more like exploited and people are realizing, um, people are getting a little bit exposed. Yeah. Uh, so dude, my biggest, yeah, my I biggest pet peeve is when, in, when, uh, is when influencers say things like, I'm so happy to be teaming up with da 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 It's like, Doug, did you just take the copy from somebody else's post? Do something else. Anyways, I'm hating now. Uh, so off of that, Instagram may be hiding uh, likes and follower counts. Yeah. Rumor has it it's in testing. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely a pro and con thing for me mm. personally i'm all here for it i think it's a benefit i think it's going to benefit like the landscape as a whole because i think it's going to make people focus more on the content and not necessarily like feeling obligated to either like or not like something or yep. oh they only have x number of followers like they must not be really doing it yeah. it's like no that's not that's not the case at all clearly um So from that perspective, I'm like totally on board. And I really think it's going to also make people, at least how I feel about it, is I think it will make people more willing to be like daring in what they post, more willing to be like out there in what they post because they're not super worried about like, oh, if this doesn't hit a certain amount of likes, like it, it wasn't it. People don't like me anymore. Yeah. Like, no, that's not it. Um, So I think people overall, I think the landscape will be more open to like newer creative posts. And uh, I think, I think it's going to be a good thing. I think, I think it definitely encourages more, it encourages more posting without a doubt, which is what Instagram wants at the end of the day. Their whole goal is to keep us on the platform Mm -hmm. for as long as possible. The more posts there are, the better. Um, Yeah. But I, but I think for them to paint it as a, as a mental health thing, I think mm-hmm. is is a little bullshit. And mm-hmm. a lot of people probably disagree with me on this, and that's fine. But here's mm-hmm. what I think: I think that from like, let's pretend I'm the person who I don't post things because I feel bad about the amount of likes that it gets. Mm-hmm. There's two lanes that I could go there. Do I feel bad because it doesn't get a lot of likes and that means that people don't like me? Or do I feel bad because it doesn't get a lot of likes and then people see that it didn't get a lot of likes and then I feel bad because of that? And I think those are two completely different things. And this only solves one of those things because I still see how many likes I have. Yeah, I was going to say it really... It's public perception and that's it. Yeah. And like the deeper issue, like real mental health, like it's, it's an internal issue if you're allowing those type of things to like 
yeah. really <laughs> alter what you're doing yeah. and dictate. That's something you need to look inward, not externally. Even what you mean like, we can't we can't blame apps for that, <laughs> dude? What I mean. Hey, uh, yeah, I think we need to all kind of take a step back and look inward sometimes. But it is <laughs> definitely – I'm serious. I know you're serious. It's just like – it's a whole episode in that subject if we wanted to. We could do a whole <laughs> no, series on it. There. But no, I think – yeah, it does only – from an app perspective, it does only accomplish that one thing. That's it. If even that, like you said, yeah. because you still see it. So you're like, well, why didn't this one pop? yeah um, if i'm so, if yeah, i care if about that for me then to, yeah for for the external which i think a lot of uh, i don't know i mean see what i'm saying uh, i think what does it really do to like appear people definitely want to it's like a signaling thing like every uh, a lot of things right now are signaling for the same reason we were talking about with brands you want to be associated with that specific brand you want to be associated with like whatever ton of likes or someone like cool liking it like oh check mark like this stuff like that's crazy sure um he must be associated with them yeah. in some capacity so he's he's ball yeah. <laughs> um which it's like I, I don't know it's just um so i think yeah i'm off i'm off topic but we'll we'll see how it goes down I'm excited we'll see for how it. it pans out. I, I'm excited for it too, overwhelmingly. Um, and I think it will make people also, from a like marketing perspective of when we're putting out social media stuff, we use those like metrics as somewhat of an indicator. But it's also, I mean, it's it's not always indicative of like what your results are. Like you could have no. a post that you could have a post that doesn't necessarily. Or a, a better example is like a blog for like specific clients where it's generated a ton of leads yeah. um, on like their CRM and they actually get real tangible business. Yeah. Big business. And it's like, oh, it, it got 20 less likes than the post the next day that was like, you know, happy Valentine's Day. I think you still would rather have the blog out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like just because, you know. So that's a crazy. Well, it's thing. just you got you get different have... things out of it. It's it's about what are you looking yeah. for out of it. And I think when you look at if you start basing, I mean, yes, you obviously need to take things like likes and comments into account when you start analyzing mm -hmm. social media posts in terms of I think direction you should go with content or copy. But it shouldn't. Yeah. It should be on a grand scale. Like it it should yeah. be like you step back and look at it from further away. Like what does this look at at ten feet? Because if you start looking at things from twelve inches from your face, you're gonna be like this one got this one got four thousand five hundred likes. This one got four thousand four hundred likes. Scrap that. <laughs> Never posting like yeah. that. It's like nah, dog. It should only, like that should only come into play when it's something it's like drastic, it's, especially when you have. Uh, especially when you have so many variables in play, like what yeah. day? What day was it? What time was it? What was the picture mm -hmm. of? Who else was posting at that time? You know what I mean? Like, there's yeah, so there's so, there's so many other things in that you can't mm -hmm. you can't just go off of likes. And you know that firsthand. Like you you probably have clients like much like me where it's there's certain times where you have something that like may be considered like a a perceived like flop of something like mm. oh the post didn't do well like you do a lot of social media so you probably have that happen like why did la like last week's did so well? well what changed yep um so i think that like conversation or having this change might help with that conversation in that like you know it's there as a tool but it's not necessarily the only factor we should be looking at and like i said if you're lucky like your clients definitely will understand that because once they start to see actual revenue generated, that's ultimately, at least if you're trying to run a successful business, that's yeah. Well, or, or traffic. I'm I'm a big traffic guy. Mm -hmm. I, whether that be traffic, actually people coming into your store, people buying things off your website, people visiting your profiles, your whatever it is. I'm a big traffic guy, and so when I look at social media, I view it as that because at the end of the day, it falls under marketing, not sales. Yeah. At least how I run it. If you want to run it on sales, that's a totally different ball game. But I I run it for in a marketing perspective. And so when I look at it like that, I I look at it as, hey, I can get people to you whether or not they want to convert. 
that's on you because yeah, it's your business. Big, yeah, if your product yeah. sucks, but your marketing's sick, they still might not buy it, but they're going to see right. it. You can get them. Yeah. If you can deliver like warm leads to whatever the sales team is or sales manager, you're definitely handling your job as far as uh, on the marketing side. Um, from our perspective, definitely. Brad, where can we find you, dude? Let's wrap this. Wrap it up. Um, can find me in uh, on Instagram, definitely LinkedIn. Cool. Um, Facebook, I would say, yeah. For uh, if you're looking for like blog content, LinkedIn, we're gonna start doing a lot more. Sweet. Um, the website is www.breakthroughmg.com. We'll put it in the description. Um, Breakthrough Marketing Group for everything else. Um, out of Boston, you'll find it. Sweet, brother. Well, we appreciate Blue you coming in, man. I, I speak for all the listeners when I say thanks for sitting with us and, and going through yeah, this. And we will definitely, this we'll definitely have you back because uh, I think anytime we uh, have a good convo on the phone, we should just yeah. pre press record and go for it and see what happens. Absolutely. We could. Uh, we got a lot of things to get into, so I'm sure we'll be sure be back here. Cool, man. Appreciate you. Love you. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks for listening to The Social Scape. If you want more, follow me on Instagram at Alex Legos Was Taken. You'll find clips of this episode, other episodes, and more social media specific content, plus pictures of me and stuff. Thanks again for listening. Now press play on that next episode and enjoy.